Good afternoon. Welcome back to the BH Virtual Event Space. You're tuned into Intro to Photography Part Six. Yes, we've finally made it to Part Six. Today we're talking about post processing, some people's favorite, some people's least favorite. And for that, welcome Sony Artisan of Imagery, Tony Gale. Tony, what's going on? Not much. How are you? I'm doing just fine. So, Good. what which are you? Is post processing a favorite or least favorite? Uh, I don't love it. Yeah, ha- I mean, you got to do it, but I don't do a ton of it. What what I do and what people will see isn't a ton of post processing. Um, most of the time, there are times when you have to, but you know, a little goes a long way. Definitely, like Scott Robert Lim says, sometimes you just have to massage an image. And I'll leave it there and let you get to the rest. And I'll remind everybody, feel free to get your questions in. Tony will get them answered. A huge thank you, of course, to Sony for sponsoring this event. And plenty more Tony Gale events will have coming up throughout the year. So stay tuned for those. Make sure to head over to YouTube for this and all of our other recorded live content, which will be archived there. Just search b h Event Space and you have the key. Tony, take it away and I'll see you in a bit for some Q&A. Sounds good. Thank you. Hi, everybody. I am Tony Gale. I'm a Sony artist of imagery. Probably most of you know that. Uh, and this is Photo 101, The Basics of Photography, Part 6 of 6, post-production. Thanks to the B&H event space. And, of course, thanks to Sony. Without Sony, I'm not here. This doesn't happen. Uh, in addition to being a Sony artist of imagery, I'm also a BenQ ambassador, a Manfrotto ambassador at x Colorado. Colorado. Well, just in case any of that come up. I am a commercial photographer based here in New York City, people and portraits primarily. I often say on my talks that we're in an exciting time to be photographers, and I really believe that. We really are. I mean, even the fact that post-production that is available to us now is more than going to the lab and processing your film and having some prints made or spending all day in a dark room. And I used to spend all day in the dark room sometimes come back the next day and look at all the color prints I'd made in the rental dark room and realize that the color was just a little off on everything. And I'd wasted a whole bunch of time and money. That's not a thing anymore. So much better. What we can do now, so much better. So as Derek mentioned, there's a ton of stuff coming up. Uh, whoop. We've got a three part getting started with your Sony camera, even though it says part one, three times it's part one, part two, and part three. Uh, we're going to be doing a 10 photos, 10 stories. You may have seen some of that on the B&H event space. And then a five-part lighting series, uh, natural light, constant light, speed light, strobes, and mixed lighting. I also always mention Alpha Universe, great place to learn more about photography, even if you don't photograph with Sony gear. Tons of inspirational stuff, tons of educational stuff. Uh, the Sony Alpha Universe forums, a good place to ask questions and get feedback on pictures and generally just be in a positive environment. The Sony Alpha Female Facebook group, which you do not have to identify as female to be a member of, uh, is also a great group. They do a $500 micro grant every month based around a specific topic. So this one, this screenshots from a couple months ago, but Jennifer Klassen was the judge. Oh wait, no, this was for Sony Alpha Female Meetup. they do occasional Sony Alpha female meetups. Uh, there was one around creative space when that happened here in October. Great group. You can win whether or not you identify as female. Uh, just be a nice person and you can join. Also, Sony has a great program if you're a professional photographer. You don't have to be full-time professional. Part-time professional is fine. Uh, Sony Imaging Pro Support. It's $100 a year. That hundred dollars gets you twenty percent discount on repairs, uh, three day business, three business day turnaround on repairs, uh, free shipping to and from. If they can't repair it in three days, they will send you a loaner to use until your repair is done. They'll also do a clean and check three times a year for free, um, for up to two eligible products each time. It's a really great program for a hundred bucks. I really recommend it. Uh, You can find all that on alphauniverse.com as well. Uh, And I'm a Sony artisan. A lot of what I'm going to be showing is shot with Sony cameras. There's a lot of great cameras out there. Always take a look at B&H. Lots of great lenses. Uh, I may call out some things specifically, but 
most of what I do with post-production here is going to be uh, applicable no matter what you shoot with. If you Even if you don't shoot with Sony, the information is the same. It is, however, just like every other talk I do, subjective, right? So my post-production and my process may be different than uh, someone else's. Somebody may insist that theirs is the best. Uh, I would say that that may be very well true for them, but there is no one right answer for everybody. So take what I'm saying, take what you're doing, take what other people say, see what works for you. Uh, I'm going to be going over, and I'm going to be going a little quick because there's a lot. Uh, transferring images to a computer, importing images into a photo application, organizing and sorting, making selects, editing, processing, editing part two, backing up, and distributing. Backing up is really going to be in there twice. All right. Uh, some of the software that I use and with the obvious exception of Sony, I am not affiliated with these other companies. Uh, Adobe Bridge, Adobe Photoshop, Adobe Lightroom, Capture One, and Sony Imaging Edge Desktop. Um, when you're looking at software and trying to figure it out, the Adobe stuff is subscription-based, at least the ones I use, Bridge, Photoshop, and Lightroom. Capture One can be subscription or perpetual license. Subscription means you pay either annually or monthly. Perpetual means you pay once and you never pay again. However, if you have a perpetual license, that usually means at a certain point when there's new updates or upgrades to the software, you no longer get those updates or upgrades. That may not be a problem uh, until you buy a new camera. So if you have a new camera, like I have the Sony Alpha CR, uh, a great compact camera, full frame. Adobe supports the raw files from that. Capture One does not yet. So I have a perpetual license for Capture One. Will my license cover raw files from that camera when they come out? I don't know. It will depend on if it's a major upgrade or not. Uh, Sony Imaging Edge Desktop is free. If you use Sony cameras, you can download it for free. Uh, it is not, in all candidness, it is not as fully featured as some of the others, uh, but it's hard to beat the price. Free is as good as it gets. There are tons of other pieces of software out there. These are only a small sampling. There's GIMP, there's Luminar, there's On One, there's Affinity, there's Photoshop Elements, which is sort of a junior version of Photoshop's. There's others. I don't really use any of those, so I can't speak to them. You know, if you go to b and and you go to uh, photo editing software, there's a lot of stuff out there. A lot of it's Adobe, there's Luminar Neo. There's Affinity, there's Capture One, there's the Adobe stuff. There's stuff I've never heard of, like Radiant Photo Software. Maybe it's awesome. I don't know. All right, let's start with transferring to a computer. So there's many ways to do this. The way I do it and the way I would recommend for most people is using a card reader, uh, both because it means that you're not using up your, you're not using your camera while you're downloading. And I often will shoot enough that I have more than one card filled up. So if you do the classic plugging your camera into your computer thing, that's a lot harder with multiple cards. Uh, so I use the Sony MRW G2 CF Express Type A slash SD memory card reader um, because I use some of the cameras that have CF Express Type A as well as SD cards. Uh, the Sony UHS-2 SD memory card reader is also very, very good if you don't need compact uh, CF Express Type A cards, and it's a quarter of the price. Um, card readers are one of those things that while there are cheaper ones, sometimes the cheaper ones really aren't very good. Either they fail pretty quickly uh, or they're just not fast. And one thing I want from a card reader is speed because I don't want to spend a lot of time downloading. I want it to go as quickly as possible. All right, so I take my card reader, I plug it into my computer. This is the folder structure that comes up on a Sony uh, card, DCIM, M4 root, private, Sony. The ones that matter are DCIM and 
private usually video goes into either m4 root or private dcim is stills when i go to dcim it brings up this folder 100 m s d c f what i typically do is rename that folder with the date the card was shot so in this example i start with the year it's 2024 which seems kind of weird uh underscore 01 01 for the month 08 for the day and there you go the reason i do that is my naming my file naming is all based on the day because it will never be today again well, or you could argue it's always today, but it will never be today is January 16th, 2024. It will not be January 16th, 2024 again. So if I name everything with today's date, I will never run into a problem where the file names duplicate. That is a common problem uh, because most cameras, every 10,000 images, the file naming restarts. So if you don't rename your files, at a certain point, you're going to have multiple files with the same name. And then the reason I rename this folder is because if I name, rename this folder, when I put the card back into a camera, it won't play those files. And I know that I've downloaded that card. It's just a way for me to be sure that I've downloaded a card because I imagine most of us, I certainly have, have put a card into my camera, checked to make sure that the pictures on there have been downloaded and then said, did I download these pictures? I'm not sure. So by doing this, I know that I have. So rename it on the card, then I drag it to whatever drive I'm using. I have a external drive, a working enterprise. It's an enterprise drive, which is designed to have longer uptime than your standard drive. So I drag the contents of that folder to working enterprise, and then I wait. And then when the next card comes in, I do the same thing. That part's pretty easy. Then you have to import it into a photo app uh, and rename. So I'm going to go over all the different pieces of software I use. There's reasons I use different ones for different things. So to start with, Bridge. So Adobe Bridge, you don't need to import. You just navigate to the folder that the files are in. So here I've navigated to this folder, uh, to this date. This was uh, this weekend. It was very, very foggy and lovely. Uh, I was in Connecticut. Navigate to that folder, select all of the files, go up to tools, batch rename, select text, and then put in the date. So 24 underscore 0113, again, 2024, January 13th. I like to use underscores. Um, and then I use a sequence number. It's either a three or four digit sequence number primary, typically. Um, I've never needed five digits in one day, but could happen. Uh, and I don't, even though this is only 34, I still stick with three just because. Um, so sequence number, start with one. You can do one, two, three, four, five, or six digits. And if you look, there's a little minus and plus next to those boxes. You can add more fields or subtract more fields. This is just what I do. And... Uh, you can say it's text or an extension or current file name or previous file name or sequence letter. You've got a lot of options there. I, again, like the date. Uh, so 24, January 20, 24, 13th, and then go. And then it just renames them, and you've got one through whatever, unique names, you're done. On the other hand, maybe you use Lightroom. So in Lightroom, you can either have one giant catalog that everything goes to, multiple smaller catalogs, you know, group by month or year or subject or whatever, or a new catalog for each thing. Uh, I tend to do catalogs by year in Lightroom. So one important thing, actually, one important thing in Lightroom that I think can be overlooked, and I know I've overlooked it, uh, is Lightroom, for whatever reason, unless you tell it to, will can strip the metadata from your files once they're processed. And I do not want that gone. The metadata needs to stay there. So one of the first things I would do next time you open Lightroom is check, go to catalog settings. Then you go to uh, catalog settings, you go to metadata, 
And then you see that little checkbox that says automatically write changes into XMP that is not blue right now. So third one down, just check it. And what that'll do is it will append the metadata so that those files keep it. The metadata is things like what camera you're using, what lens you're using. If you have the copyright uh, settings in your camera turned on to put your name in there, uh, it will include that, all that stuff. I want that there. So that's Lightroom just for importing. Uh, and then in, in Lightroom, you just, uh, you go to library, rename photos, same thing as Bridge. They're very, very similar. Uh, one thing I don't love about Lightroom for naming is that it won't let you use underscores. It, it uses, uh, you can type in underscores, but between the name that you put in and a sequence number, so 24 underscore 0113, then I use an underscore and then the number. Lightroom always puts a dash. I don't know why. I keep trying to find a solve. So far, I haven't found one. But Lightroom uses a dash, and I don't love that, so I rarely rename in Lightroom. Then we have Capture One. I really recommend sessions, not catalogs, in Capture One. Catalogs does stuff that I don't love. Some people love it. Uh, you can, same thing as Lightroom. You can create a new session every time or just have one. I tend to just have a working session because I don't import into Capture One. I just navigate to the folder just like with Bridge. But maybe we create a new session, decide where you're going to put that session, and then there you go, navigate to the folder. And then Capture One, same thing, select them all, right click, batch rename is second one down. Uh, I use text and tokens, much like Bridge and Lightroom, you can select a lot of different things, but I do job name and three digit counter. And then the job name is just the date again. So in this case, it would be 240113 underscore. This is uh, what's in there is from the last time I'd renamed in Capture One. Uh, you can pair RAWs and JPEGs. Uh, you can reset the rename counter, you can set the rename counter, all that stuff. Pairing raw and JPEG is good because if you're shooting raw and JPEG, you want probably for the each file to have the matching name. So the first picture you took that's a raw and a JPEG of the exact same thing at the same instance, you want to have the same number just with a JPEG or a raw at the end. And you can select all sorts of things, one digit counter, two digit counter, address, Camera serial number, categories, you can put all sorts of stuff in. But I like to keep it simple. You can save a custom preset, all sorts of stuff. And then Lightroom, like I said, uh, we're going back to it. Lightroom, you do have to import. So you've got your catalog, whatever it's called, you can go to import. On the lower left, click on import, navigate to where you want to import or drag and drop. Make sure that everything you want to import is checked. Uh, I typically have include subfolders checked in the upper left. Then you just hit import and it goes. And then like I said before, same thing, library, uh, rename photos, put in the name, uh, file name and sequence. But again, you can see where the example is that it won't let it do an underscore. Imaging Edge Desktop uh, doesn't really rename as a batch. Uh, so if you're going to use that, you just open it up and rename another way. You don't have to import anything. You just navigate to the folder that the images are in. And there you go. So this is an important thing. You've done that, you've renamed, you've copied everything to your computer. Now you need to back up. Every single hard drive ever made will fail eventually. It doesn't matter if you bought it today or a week ago or a month ago or a year ago, eventually it will fail. So back up. The first thing I do after everything is downloaded to the computer and renamed, and I wait till it's renamed because I don't want uh, version control issues, is I back it up. So I have the working hard drive it's on. I have two other hard drives that it gets copied to. I have a desktop drive. 
you know, that's got a power supply and everything. And then I have a portable, usually a five terabyte drive. A copy of the entire folder goes to each drive. Once those two drives are full, one goes home, the smaller one goes home and lives at our condo in Brooklyn. The other one lives in Manhattan in my office. So they're in two different places. And while they're still working files, while they're still on the working drive, they're in three places. The raw files are in three places. After I'm no, no longer actively working on that, uh, and once my working drive is full, then I only have them in two places. Now, there are a lot of people, and they're probably right, who say best practices is to always have everything in three places. I don't always have all my raw files in three places once they're old enough, only because the processed files are in multiple places. I've got the raw files in two places. It, it just feels like enough. That may hurt me some point. We'll see. So to start with, things are on the local working drive that I'm actually doing active stuff on and then backed up to two external drives. This is what it looks like. The big drives, the little drives. Also, I copy all of those other drives to new drives every few years to larger drives because there's something called bit rot where uh, magnetic media, if it just sits there and it isn't spun up, uh, eventually you can start getting corruption and lose files, even though nothing happened. It just sat there. And over time, things just go squirrely. So periodically, you need to boot it up, uh, check everything. And when I do that, usually hard drives have gotten cheaper and bigger. So I'll just copy everything to new hard drives that are bigger. The little hard drives, relatively inexpensive, you know, $134, $135 for a five terabyte drive. 150, 170 for an eight terabyte drive. I don't have specific drives that I recommend, um, but part of the reason I use the small drives and the big drives is so that it's never the exact same type of drive from the same period that everything is backed up to. So if there is a batch of drives from some manufacturer that had a problem, I wanna make sure that even if I have one of those drives, I don't have two. So the other one is something else. All right, we backed up. Now we're gonna organize and sort. So typically I will sort by shot and subject. So obviously everything is sorted by the day. If I'm photographing say four people, I might have subfolders that say A, B, C, and D, E, F, whatever. If I do that, I usually include that in the numbering that we did earlier. I didn't go into it, but if I photograph four people today, the first one is going to be, it's the 16th, 240116 underscore A underscore, then the numbering. Next one is underscore B, then the numbering, C, then the numbering, D, then the numbering, just because it helps keep things separated, especially because I might be photographing Person one for a few minutes, then person two, then person three, then back to person one, then person four. And because the, everything is out of sequence with them, it's easier to separate them and renumber them. Uh, and I just do A, B, C, D, E, et cetera. Then I rate the images. So in Capture One, what I typically do, because I shoot a lot, I will rarely, although sometimes, uh, but rarely will I look at each individual file big, um, only because it just takes forever. Uh, what I'll do is look at the thumbnails, usually blow up the thumbnails big, and just go through and start control clicking on a PC. Control click so it keeps everything selected. You know, click, click on one and three and seven and 14. Everything that catches my eye, I'll click on it, give it a one. Boom. In capture one, everything that's selected, if you hit one, it just gets a one, two, and then I'll look at all the ones and narrow it down, narrow it down, narrow it down until it feels like a manageable number to really look at individually. Uh, that's what I typically do. Stuff that catches my eye as a thumbnail is probably worth looking at because we're so used to things, seeing things small. Um, but there are shoots and times where, where I will look at everything individually large. Lightroom, similar thing. 
Uh, although if I'm going to look at everything large, Lightroom is the way to go. If you have uh, a single image up in the library view and you have caps lock on, uh, if you hit zero or one, it will automatically advance to the next one. So if you need to look at each one individually, I have one finger on zero, one finger on one, and I'll just give everything a zero or one and it automatically advances and I don't have to click anything. But typically, same thing as with Capture One, I'll look through, I'll click on, control click on everything that I think is worth looking at later. Um, and same thing, I'll hit one, however, or two or whatever. In Lightroom, if you hit one and you've got a bunch of stuff selected, other things need to be set for it to give them all a one. You need to be on that little grid survey mode. You can see the arrow on the lower left there. If you're not on that, if you're on any of the others, like here I'm on survey mode instead of whatever the other one is called. Um, if I hit, I hit the number two, you can see it said set rating to two. Only the first image got changed to two. The others did not. Because it has to be, even though there's multiple things selected, it has to be the one that's really selected. So be careful of that because I've made that mistake where I thought I labeled things and I didn't. So it has to be the little grid selection. Bridge, same thing, select whatever you want to select. But bridge, for whatever reason, it's control one or control two, and it will tag everything that you have selected with the number. Imaging edge, similar to capture one, select however many you want to select and just hit one or two or whatever, and it will add a one or a two or whatever you picked to each image that you have selected. All right, I know we're going through it fast. Uh, as we get deeper now, color management is important. Make sure you have a good color accurate monitor, the best you can get. Ideally, at least 100% of sRGB and calibrate your monitor. I calibrate my monitors. I have a BenQ SW321C uh, on my desktop right behind the camera pointed at me. Uh, and I calibrate uh, about once every month or six weeks. It's important to make sure that you're dealing with the most accurate color you can, even though other people may not be. And as we're processing and thinking about color space, there's a lot of options out there. sRGB is a smaller color space. Adobe RGB is a larger color space. You can see here, this file from xrite.com. There's more latitude in Adobe RGB and then Pro Photo RGB is even larger. I typically process into Adobe RGB and deliver in sRGB because not everything can handle Adobe RGB. All right, so let's talk about pro or uh, editing in your software. Here we've got Capture One. The first thing I typically do, and hopefully I've done this, although sometimes even I forget, is I shoot a gray card under each lighting situation. I select the, oh, there's a question. Peter Marcus, do you use, utilize a cloud service to save your images? Uh, Peter, I do use a cloud service. I do save all my processed images on the cloud. Um, and I'll, I'll get to that towards the end. I use something called uh, Photo Shelter, but it's only my processed images. Um, I have way too much data to upload every raw file I have. It's just it's just too much. But all the raw files are in the cloud. Or I'm sorry, all the processed files are in the cloud, which is still a lot. All right, so this is an X-ray color checker. It's to make sure I have as accurate color as possible. Just click on the eyedropper, click on the gray, click on the up arrow on the upper right, select everything I want to apply that color setting to, and then click down. So I intentionally made these colors look weird on the top, the blue. I've selected the gray. It's been saved. I just click on that down arrow in the upper right. And now everything has accurate color. Very easy. Uh, 
if you're shooting raw. If you're shooting JPEG, it's much more important to get your color right in camera. And everything I'm doing, and I always shoot raw, if you shoot JPEG and you're happy with it, it's not that anything is something that every professional has to do or every photographer has to do. I know working professionals that almost never shoot raw. They almost always shoot JPEG just because they shoot so much they don't want to deal with it. I prefer raw. I prefer the latitude and, and the control and the flexibility I have. Um, but do what works for you. All right. So here, if I open up this file, it felt a little, just a little bit dark. I like the contrast. I like the darkness. So you can see on the left under high dynamic range, capture one, I just dragged the shadow slider over a little just to bring up the shadows a little, select both the images that are similar. And then just apply it to both of them. Come over here. Here, I felt like the highlights were a little high. His shirt was a little blown out. So I just moved the highlight slider to the left. That's the kind of thing I typically do in the raw processing software before I bring it to Photoshop. In Bridge, if you want to deal with the raw files, you can go to right click, open in camera raw or control R. Open up whatever you want to play with. Here I have uh, this picture of moss and lichen. So there it is. It feels like the bright spots are a little too bright. So I just slid the highlight slider down. And then I'm going to just play with the color a little. Every raw processor, Lightroom, Capture One, um, they all have color profiles. And people like to talk about color science a lot. People like to talk about this camera's color or that camera's color is better. Really anybody from any manufacturer, you should be able to make look good. And there's just different ways to do it. It's rarely that one is inherently better. You may like it better, but accurate isn't necessarily better. Better isn't necessarily accurate. It, it's a very subjective thing. But if you're in Adobe, it's going to default to Adobe Color. You can see it on the upper right here. So this is Adobe Color. We'll see how much of a difference we see uh, or you see. Then I'm changing it to Adobe Landscape. So Adobe Color, Adobe Landscape. You can see, hopefully you can see that that color changed. Then Adobe Portrait, Landscape Portrait. You can see it changed again. Standard, Vivid, Monochrome, obviously that one. Back to Adobe Color. So what those profiles do, and Capture One has them, Lightroom has them, the engine in Adobe Bridge and Adobe Lightroom is the same, um, is it changes the way that the color is interpreted. So you may find that while the default is Adobe Color, you really like Adobe Portrait or Adobe Landscape or whatever. You can also make custom profiles. I usually leave it on the basic, and if I need to, I'll make a custom one. All right. And then maybe I think it's a little cool. I wish the white balance was a little off. So just slide the color slider or the temperature slider on the upper right. This was as shot. Now I've warmed it up by sliding it to the right. Then I can go back, select everything I want to apply that to, open in camera raw again. The file on the left is the one that I did those settings to. I can now select all four of those files that I selected. Uh, right click, go to sync. It brings up this. It asks me what settings I want to synchronize. One thing to keep in mind is that if you're cropping a bunch of stuff, crop doesn't by default get checked. Uh, but just make sure that whatever you changed is selected. Hit OK. And now they all have those settings applied. Lightroom, similar thing. We've got uh, some more choices, though. So if you look on the lower right, we have auto sync or sync. So auto sync, if you have more than one thing picked, Every time you make a setting to whatever file is in your main viewer, it will apply it to all of them. Uh, if you don't have auto sync selected, 
when you select multiple things, as you can see here on the lower right, you've got a sync button and then you hit the sync button to apply it to everything. So we started here. Maybe I don't like the blue color, although I do like the blue color. So let's neutralize it a little, make it feel less morning, nighty, and more daytimey. So I've adjusted the color, color temperature in the upper right. Add a little contrast, contrast slider. Then I'm going to select a bunch of pictures, hit the sync button, and much like Bridge, it brings up this window, but with a lot more options. And you just want to make sure whatever it is you just did is selected. You hit synchronize. And now all of those files have the same settings. And like uh, with Bridge, you've got Adobe Color, Adobe Landscape, Portrait, Standard, Vivid, Monochrome, plus a whole bunch of other crazy ones. So if you click on Browse, you can see on the right there, there's Vintage 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. There's modern one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. There's a whole bunch of stuff. You may find something in there that is exactly right for you, that speaks to you, and that is exactly what you want to do. I usually don't use that. Uh, Imaging Edge, right click on it, open with Edit, brings up this window, and you've got all those menus on the right. Click the little arrow. You can adjust brightness, white balance, uh, creative style. So if you really, 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 really like uh, the JPEGs from your camera, but you want to shoot raw and you wonder why the JPEGs always look different than your raw files do, the way to fix that is to use, if you shoot Sony, use the Imaging Edge software because it is going to process them the most similar to how the camera does. Adobe or Capture One or whoever has their own secret sauce to process, and it's different. So if you like your JPEGs, but you want to shoot raw, shoot or process with the raw processor for your camera, like, like Sony Imaging Edge Desktop. You also, Sony has creative styles that you can set in the camera. They don't apply to the raw files, typically. You can add those here under creative style in uh, imaging edge and adjust them as you would like. So you've got your <laughs> your standard, your vivid, your landscape, your clear, your deep, etc. So I just added landscape just because you can go in, adjust the contrast, all that stuff. Um, one thing you can also do is save your settings as a permanent thing to apply to multiple things. So you go up to here, save, save it. And now in the future, you can add the settings from that file to whatever you want. You just pull it up there. All right. I'm going quick, this is a lot. Um, we've, process we've done our editing, we've made the file look how we want it, but it's still a raw file, right? All the changes and edits you do to a raw file are just notes. They're not actually affecting the actual file. They're just telling the software what to do with it. So do you want to process as a JPEG or a TIFF? JPEG is a compression. TIFFs are uncompressed. I almost always process as a TIFF, and then I'll make JPEGs later if I need to. JPEGs take up less space, but the quality degrades with every save. Uh, TIFF files take up more space, but are lossless and image quality does not degrade. 8-bit or 16-bit, I almost always process in 16-bit. It's got way more colors, even though the cameras typically are 14-bit. That 15th and 16th bit is interpolated, but there's more information. You're less likely to have banding, uh, but the files are twice as big. Um, and what I will do is process everything in 16-bit TIFFs in Adobe RGB 98. And then I have various actions in Photoshop uh, for image delivery and things like that. So once I'm done with it, with the layered TIFF, I can hit the action and it'll make it an 8 bit JPEG in SNG. So capture one, we want to process. So all you have to do really, open capture one, select the images, uh, at the top left, there's an export button. You select export. It gives you all these options 
Uh, there's different export recipes. You can make new ones. You can customize them. Uh, you tell it where you want it to save. You tell it what kind of file format, profile, compressed, uncompressed, scale. So maybe you don't want it to be the full size. Maybe you want it 50%, whatever. Select all those just to export and uh, boom, it starts saving. Lightroom, you can go to File, Export. Similar thing, you select everything that you want, JPEG, PSD, TIFF, PNG, DNG, original, etc. You tell it where you want it to save, if it's JPEG, what quality, what resolution, all that stuff. Tell it where to go. And then it exports. Imaging Edge Desktop, you select the picture. Uh, on the top there, sort of in the middle, there's an output button. You click on that, brings up this menu, same thing, 8-bit, 16-bit, what color space you want. Uh, is it a TIFF? Is it a JPEG? Where do you want it to go? And then you hit save, and there it goes. And it will warn you if the working color space and the developing color space are different. Also, there's something very cool that some Sony cameras do that. Alpha 7 R3, the Alpha 7 R4, the Alpha 7 R5, and the Alpha 1 have something called Pixel Shift. Pixel Shift is super cool. It's uh, a setting where it shoots, depending on which camera you have, four or 16 shots. The Alpha 7 R3, it's four shots. The others can do four or 16. And it makes a file that's either, if it's four shot, it has more accurate color because digital files use a Bayer array where each photo site is either red, green, or blue. By moving the sensor, you get red, green, and blue at each photo site. So it takes four shots, it moves the sensor, so you get more accurate color. With the 16 shot, you get more accurate color and a file that's four times the size. So the way that you get those files is using Imaging Edge Desktop with pixel shift. So you select everything that you shot with pixel shift in camera. You have to tell the camera to shoot pixel shift. It will do it. You right click, you click on uh, create pixel shift multi-shot composite. Um, one cool thing with the current versions of the software is if you select everything you shot, it will, it knows what was a pixel shift and it will just process them out one after the other. Uh, you can tell it, if you want to adjust or just go with the flow. So you click on that, you bring it in. You can save it as a special raw file for this ARQ format or as a TIFF or as a JPEG. You tell it where you want it to go. I typically do TIFFs. And then it just combines them and makes this magic thing. It's very cool. Bridge for processing. Control R, you can just go to open or save or or open will open a processed file into Photoshop. If you look in the upper right, I'm pointing at my screen like you guys can see it. Down there at my screen. In the upper right where I've got the red uh, is a down arrow. If you click that, it will save your process files to wherever. Bring up this menu. Same thing. They're all pretty similar. All right. You've got your edited file, you're ready to go. Next thing I do is I check for dust. So I will go in at 100% or 200% over the entire file and just see if there are dust spots on the sensor because there often are, especially if you shoot at 16 or 22, F16 or F22. Maybe add a little curve. Uh, if I'm gonna do that, I always do a new layer because that means I can change it later without degrading the image. So new layer, added a little contrast. Now I'm just going to go save it. Boom. All right. Similar thing. This is an example of a picture where maybe I'm going to send it to a retoucher. So I go in. Um, if I'm going to do this, the first thing I've done is made a JPEG, sent it to the retoucher. So files come back. What I do, uh, if it's a retoucher, there's different tiers of retouchers. So sometimes I'll use cheap overseas retouchers 
who are not always great, um, but they're very, very inexpensive. If it's a job with a budget, I will always use a local retoucher who is amazing and who I trust. But for the overseas retouchers, I bring everything in as a layer. So if you look in the lower right, you can see background and level one, layer one. Layer one is the retouch JPEG from the retoucher. The background is my original file so that I can see what's changed and I can fix things if they went too far. In this instance, it was fine. Uh, maybe the curves layer, add a little boost, clean up some of the scuffs on the floor with the healing brush. Uh, here I brought down the overall brightness a little, but you know, there's a lot of cool fancy tools now, right? So there's the, all the AI stuff. I don't love a lot of it. Some of it is really cool. I have no interest or very little interest in creating images whole cloth with AI because I like taking pictures. I like starting with something that's actually there, you know, actually interacting with a person, actually seeing something, not just making a digital illustration. There are things that are very cool. So here, I've selected the subject. I inverse selected, so it's the background. And what I typed in generative fill here, I went to fill, generative fill, is sitting on a tree. It does some thinking. If you look on the right, it's generating four variations. There's one variation. Here's another variation. Um, you can also tell it you don't like those and to do and pick one of those three and then tell it to make three more based on that. But it can do some cool stuff. Like this is kind of amazing. And this, if I were to do this myself in retouching, would take me forever. I'm just not a good enough retoucher to do this with any kind of speed. And this is where I think AI can really help is with processing with things like this where you want a different background, but nothing specific, it can be really cool. I still want it to be the real person. I don't want it to generate the person, uh, but it can make an, a new background for me. That's cool. So for those of you who are curious, the original on the left with the new background on the right. There's also, sometimes I like to make giant panoramas. So that foggy picture we did uh go to photoshop go to automate go to batch uh or automate uh photo merge um so click on that it brings up this menu i almost always start with auto you just browse and select all the pictures you can select the xmp files it doesn't matter select them all just hit okay Depending on how fast your computer is and how big the files are, this could take some time. But what it does is it magically combines them all. So this is a huge panoramic. 26,098 pixels by 8,496 pixels um, from the upstairs window of that foggy morning of the woods, which I think looks pretty cool. Now... What I really did, that was the kind of simple version with one shot each. Pixel shift, which I mentioned, which I think is super cool. The pixel shift panorama, where it's four times the size for each one, 58,124 pixels by 16,531 pixels, which is 193 inches by 55 inches at 300 pixels per inch. Uh, so 193, 55 is four and a half feet. 193 is 15 feet. Uh, it's a huge file, which is very, very cool. All right. Then delivery, you've processed all your files. You've done everything. You may want to convert it to Adobe RGB or sRGB or Profoto RGB or CMYK or TIFF or JPEG or PSD or PSB or PNG. Uh, that just depends on what your needs are. JPEG or TIFF, for most people, most of the time, are going to be fine. And you want to think about, are you just processing the files? Are you sending them to your mom to be printed? Are you printing them? Are you printing it at home? Is it just going on Instagram? I, when I'm distributing files for a client, use Photoshelter or WeTransfer. 
Uh, typically photo shelter because I can set passwords and permissions. I just create a folder, upload it, add a password and send them the link, create password. I can tell them view only original file, original size, small, large, medium, whatever. Uh, we transfer, you just drag and drop. And then when everything is said and done, as someone asked previously, the final processed images go onto a local RAID 5 system in my office. They go onto, uh, onto Photo Shelter where I have an unlimited data account, unlimited storage. I have something like 30 terabytes up there right now um, by year. So I have a folder for 2023, a folder for 2022, a folder for 2021, uh, all the way back to 20, 20, 2003, I think is my first digital files. Um, and then a scans folder. But everything that I shot in 2023 is in the 2023 folder. Everything from 2022 is in the 2022 folder. So that's the cloud storage I use. And then I also have recently started using an offsite uh, NAS RAID 5 that files also go on to. So this is why I don't have the ROS backed up in three places because I have the processed files backed up in three places. The offsite NAS is in Connecticut, photo shelter is in the cloud and redundant. And then the local RAID 5 is redundant. RAID 5 allows me to lose, there's five drives in it, I think. And if I lose one drive, I don't lose any information. There's my photo shelter by year. All right, that was a lot. It was really a lot and it went quick. It's just a high level overview. I know I didn't go deep on anything. Um, let's see if there are any questions beyond the one about uh, the cloud. Yes, let's open it up for questions, Tony. As always, what's your favorite part of post processing while we're we're waiting for any questions? I'm finding the pictures that I'm like, oh, that one looks. I really like that one. That's my favorite part. Do you ever use you shoot a higher megapixel? What what's what's the alpha one? Is that about alpha one is six, fifty megapixels, 50. and the Alpha Seven R five is sixty one. Do you ever use the the megapixel to get the crop in? I mean, what's your normal? I, I sometimes I'll sometimes crop in, um, especially because I would always rather shoot a little too wide and crop later than wish I shot wider and didn't. You know, you lose the hand or something. And sure, with the generative stuff, maybe you can rebuild the hand, but it's not the real hand. It's a pretend hand. I want the real hand. Um, and then if I'm, you know, sometimes I'll shoot birds or wildlife just for fun. I'm not an expert at that. As you'll recall, I showed Mark Smith's really good bird photos next to my um, marginally adequate bird photos. Um, and for that, being able to crop in is huge because... You know, unless you're really, really close, even with a 600 millimeter lens, birds are small and far away. Agreed. I use it more than I more than when when I shoot with a higher megapixel count. I shoot a lot yeah. of twenty, a lot of twenty four megapixel, which is enough for me. Uh, we do have a question from Pete joining us. Is Sony Imaging Edge reliable in the field? He's using a seven R three. I'm not sure what reliable in the field means. I mean, yeah, I haven't. I don't have issues with it. I don't use it a ton, but I've used it to tether. It's been fine. I've used it to process. It's been fine. Um, like I said, it's not as fully featured as the other software, um, but it's free. Can't be free. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't encourage anyone to use anything for the first time in the field without trying it at home and making sure they feel good about it. Definitely. All right. Well, it looks like we covered the Q&A with that. So, uh, look, you're going to be back plenty of times yes. in the coming the coming weeks, months, years. So if anybody does have any questions that they didn't think of, slip their mind. Well, I went we'll I back. went fast and over a lot. So people might be like 40 slides back. They're like, wait, wait a minute. They're catching up They're We're going to be logged off by the time they, they get to the end and realize. Yeah, exactly. Questions. Well, it's good. We got you coming back very soon, as we saw with the, the upcoming schedule. And, uh. We'll take care of those questions then. We'll tap the loose ends. I'm sure there will be some. Sounds good. Awesome. Huge thank you to Tony again.
to Sony for hosting, and to all of our viewers out there for tuning in. Again, you can catch this and all of our other live archived content over on YouTube at b &H Event Space. But that is all we have for now. Another rendition of the b &H Virtual Event Space now in the books. Catch on. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Tony.